Hello everyone and welcome to the Omega Metroid Podcast. My name is Andy Spateri and as always, joined by Dakota Lasky. Dak, how you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm doing alright. Not too bad. I uh, was a little sick recently, but feeling better. So yeah. That's very good. That's uh, why this episode is coming to you a little bit later than uh, than usual. Because we need Sorry, Dak to... Uh, well, we, we need you at your full strength, because we have a lot to talk about uh, this week. This is our second ever Mapping Metroid segment. Um, the first Mapping Metroid, where we focused on the Fendrana Drifts, was actually one of our most popular shows ever. So I'm hoping that uh, that you guys are just, like, really into the idea of picking apart a section and just not really into Fendrana Drifts itself. Because I'm really excited to get into what we are talking about today, which is a kind of bonus uh, extra area added to Metroid Zero Mission, Chozodia. Not uh, not what would have been my first like pick, but when someone suggested it to us, I was like, you know what? This really is like one of the most absolutely interesting and unique areas in all of Metroid, and I'm really excited to uh, to talk about it in depth today. What about you? Yeah, this isn't the the pick I was expecting to go to after Fendrana Drifts, but I think that's probably a good thing. Um, you know, it's certainly a very memorable and unique area and section of Zero Mission. Uh, for you know, obviously reasons we're gonna get into later, but yeah, I, I like this area and certainly sticks out to me as a fan of Zero Mission, which of course, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm sure all of you are. Um, but it wasn't the 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 immediate pick I would have assumed, so I like that we're going somewhere a little uh, not expected, I guess. Yeah, it's it's almost like the exact opposite of Fendrana, where like it, you, I mean, obviously you're going from 3D to 2D, but you're also this particular section is just, it's really unlike any other section in the series. And, uh, you know, our Fendron episode was was a long one, and I feel like this one might just rival that. So, Dak, why don't we just uh, dive right into Chozodia here and get going? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's dive in. All right, so we're going to do this the same kind of way that we did uh, Fendron in our first Mapping Metroid segment, where we're going to focus on just the, the level and the impressions that we had playing through it, uh, just in more generalities. Uh, we're, we'll get into some of the power-ups and expansions, we'll get into little tidbits and lore that we liked, uh, we'll chat about the music, and then we'll chat about some of the enemies and the bosses here. But let's start with, you know, the setting for getting to Chozodia. Um, I think that you know, almost everybody that played Metroid Zero Mission would have probably assumed that as soon as you beat Mother Brain, the game is over, it's done, and, you know, roll credits, see an X mission, but that's not what Zero Mission does. Instead, it has Samus's ship shot out of the sky and uh, come crashing back to to Zevis, which also strips her of her power suit and basically all the weaponry that you've spent the entire game accruing. So you start off and you're... You know, you were a far cry from the the badass warrior that just beat the head of the space pirates. You're now in a zero suit, and you are basically powerless. And all you have at your side is a little paralyzer gun, which can stun pirates, and not even for that long. So immediately, this just presents something completely different. It's a completely different kind of a spin on the, the usual way that, that Metroid presents its areas. This one is very much like a stealth mission almost or like at least if it's not stealth you've got to be in and out as quick as you can with taking as little damage as you can because really for really one of the first times in metroid you are powerless to fight back yeah i, I would say you're about as powerless as you were against like the six and fusion you can like a, a eventually like freeze it but that's about it um i like that at least there is that interactivity where you can stun the pirates to give yourself a little bit of an edge to get away um, rather than just being completely helpless, at least you can use your skills and acrobatics to, to overcome things. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, when you look at it in terms of like how it looks, it is an extension of Criteria. I love the, the general vibe of the area, but yeah, in terms of like gameplay, it is very dis uh, distinctly different from really anything we've ever seen from Metroid. Cause you really don't have to be very stealthy when you're in a power suit, right? You don't, it doesn't really matter. You kind of just, unless you're up against, I guess the SAX. Um, so, and in Zero Mission, I liked how it really emphasized, even though you just, t you know, spent a lot of the time taking out all the enemies on, on Zevis and, and Space Pirates, now you're going up against them again, and they're a much tougher opponent, and really gives you a different perspective and, and, uh, and feeling going up against, you know, 
enemies that you have encountered previously and others you haven't. Um, yeah, so this is a really cool segment. I like that it's not like... I mean, this is another segment, too, because I think ever since we talked about, like, having, an, uh, you know, an entire Zero Suit game, right? Like, obviously, the first thing we'd think of is, like, what would that be like? Well, it'd probably be something similar to this area of Zero Mission, potentially, or maybe not. But um, I like that it's, you know, it's not an entire game, but I love this. Like, it's a, such a perfect amount, I think, of, of stealth gameplay for, for a Metroid game, and I like how it, like, it's an end cap for the game. Um, so, yeah, I, this is, I like the, how different it is. It's the right amount of different, and... Um, yeah, it's a solid package. Yeah, I, I'm actually a big fan of stealth gameplay, and I pitched it on our Zero Mission episode. We actually just did a, an episode on the Zelda podcast talking about stealth and Zelda, so, like, I'm in kind of the stealth mood, but, like, I, man, I, I just love stealth gameplay, and especially when, like, the enemies are so much stronger than you, and, like, if you get caught, it's basically game over. And to add to something that you said, like, yeah, you don't really have to hide away from any enemies in Metroid, particularly when you've went the whole game building up your powers i mean like keep Mm -hmm. in mind like when you fight mother brain you have your super missiles you have your space jump you have your screw attack i mean you have like the whole enchilada here and you are as powerful as you're going to get the only power up you're missing is your power bomb so you're really i mean you're almost in god mode at the end of the game so like you're not hiding from anybody so to be taken back right down to peg one and, and even lower than peg one in fact is really cool and it was like it was such a um, it was so unexpected for me like like i said like when i beat mother brain i was like okay great like game's over i was really satisfied with that i was really happy with that and then they offer up this whole different area with this whole different mechanic and, and i think you're right it didn't overstay its welcome too too long but i did i just really liked that it offered something extra to do and like it's something different to do um beyond just like you know the regular shooting platforming etc etc so I, i'm a big fan of stealth gameplay in general um but i want to circle back to something that you said about uh the area itself chozodia it, it really is an extension of criteria but i i really do love how it feels very like ominous when you first get there like you've got the rain that's coming down um and i think that that just adds to the feel i love that you can see especially at the beginning like, I love that you can see the space pirates walking around, like, yeah. kind of crawling underneath them. And, like, you're just like, oh, God, I hope they can't hear me. Or, like, I don't want to do anything to to alert their attention. It's very tense. And it's a very, I think, ominous is, is the perfect word to describe it. It's very, very cool. I like the I like the vibe of Chozodia a lot. I, you know, I always thought it was funny how the space pirates just have the absolute, like, worst, like, awareness of their surroundings. Cause they just they they have like these these huge like see through tubes that they're walking around in. They still don't see you crawling around in this like bright blue jumpsuit. I don't know. Um, I always thought it was funny how they're they are still a formidable you know opponent, but at times they can the AI at times can be a little like uh, I don't know if they're really looking for me. But um yeah I, I mean I always I mean you know when you add rain to like any kind of setting it really just ups the ambiance really. Uh, it does feel ominous. It really, uh, at times, it really feels like the most that uh, the most that Samus is kind of on her own, most isolated. But at the same time, very much reminding her of the stakes. Like back in the background, you got those space pirates you got to deal with. You're crawling around near the ship, Ridley ship, um, and then of course you end up in in the the Chozo trials area. Yeah, this is. I think it's it's pretty classic, like Metroid uh you know area building it doesn't do anything too like wildly different in terms of that um i like how big the area is though um when you add the the test area you know it really you know has you know a bit of a rear end to it but um which obviously is different from criteria which is a pretty small area if if i remember correctly uh from zero mission so i like that i like that it expanded on the parts of the original game that weren't too delved into you know criteria small area uh, the Chozo is obviously worked into the game, but, like, in the original game, uh, you know, it's, it's not super lore-heavy or anything. It doesn't really give you a ton of information, and I'd say the Chozo are pretty equally treated in comparison to the Space Pirates and Mother Brain in terms of representation. In this game, it really does give you more of that Chozo and backstory and lore stuff, and I like that they dedicated a whole area to this. Um, it really, you know, showed, like, the importance of it, too. It's its own section. Uh, the stakes are high. It, it, you know, has this important feel to it in terms of, like, the weather and how it looks, and it's... it's it's spacious compared to, you know, this point in time in the game where you feel almost at your smallest. So, um, yeah, I think what they did with this was great. And I love that they didn't, uh, 
it wasn't it wasn't uh, too crazy, but it wasn't too safe. And I like that they did something different while also still making it, you know, look pretty reminiscent of usual what we expect in, uh, from Metroid in terms of like its outward uh, outward appearance. Mm-hmm. And I want to touch a little bit more on some of the uh, the Chozo lore in particular when we when we get a little bit further into the show. I'll leave it for right now, but I really like what you said right there. Um, I you know just to piggyback on another thing you said. I do like that you get the map almost right away. And yeah. You can see almost all of uh, Chozodia, but then like there's the the hidden trial area, which is like uh, it's almost entirely um, like green tile, which is the secret areas in, in Metroid Zero Mission. So like it's actually far bigger than you think it's going to be when you first get there. So I think that's actually really cool about it as well. But yeah, so this is you know the the setting is really cool. And you start off, and you're sneaking around, you're entirely powerless, and it forces you really to think about doing rooms in a, in a different, sneakier way. Uh, like I said, I'm a big fan of stealth gameplay, and there's a lot of things that I think that are done really well. But, like, they're really simple, but they're really well. Um, the green lasers that are running up and down the wall, like shooting those those high-beam lasers at you, are, uh, are a nice touch. Uh, ditto. With the roaming spotlights, I think that not only do they look cool, but like they're you know they're decently hard to to get around. Um, and you mentioned earlier you were talking about the SAX. I actually jotted down when I was playing like getting caught by the space pirates is is almost reminiscent of some of the SAX chases. It's not as scary, of course, because you still have way more of a chance to get away from these space pirates than you do the SAX. Because as you said, the space pirates aren't exactly Albert Einstein, but it's still, uh, it's still like a thrill and a rush when you're like trying to run away and you've got these guys like shooting beams at you. And I think every one of their beam takes out a full energy tank worth of health. So like you've got to be, you got to be going and you got to know exactly where you're gonna hide. And there are some parts, there are some portions here where like getting seen and getting uh, noticed by the space pirates is unavoidable. So like you just got to deal with it. So um, I like that it, uh, I like that it ramps up that tension when when you do get caught it doesn't feel as you know intense as the sax but also the space pirates aren't a threat on the same level as the sax so i i like it i think with like infusion with the sx i almost felt like i never had a chance against it so i would almost like not try but there's certainly times in zero mission where i was just like ah screw being stealthy and i would just you know run in front of the 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 lasers or run in front of the spotlight anyway and just start like trying to you know tail it against the space pirates who are chasing me because I like that little distinction there, is that even though you are, you know, a little more helpless and, and whatnot, you still feel like you, you have a chance and you can still kind of use your expertise to, to get around it. And then you don't feel super, super helpless. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I love those sequences where you're running, you know, you're running away from a bunch of different pirates and you got to not be perfect, but you got to be pretty on point in terms of your escape. And then finally, you know, getting away from them and waiting for the alarm to go away so you can get back to, all right, I'm going to stealth it out this time. And you're right, there are certain sections where you kind of have, you couldn't avoid that. Um, but other times where you kind of maybe want to do it yourself, maybe up the uh, excitement a little bit or just be like, I don't have enough yeah. patience, which was me sometimes. I'm like, I don't want to crawl through this anymore. Um, and it gives you that little bit of, uh, not creativity, I guess, but a little flexibility. Whereas I guess with fusion, you kind of almost you, you pretty much could only run away and and maybe hope to land, um, you know, a stun real quick. But you know, with the you know the fusion missile or something like that. But uh, for the most part, I always felt so helpless against the SAX. And at least in this, it doesn't feel as helpless, which I think makes a lot of sense because certainly the SAX is a much more, uh, much more of a threat than the space pirates themselves individually probably will ever be. But uh, yeah, I like that. You know, there's still a little bit of you know like that excitement of getting caught and trying to get away and and hoping it doesn't happen in the first place. I liked all the different things you have to avoid, the lasers and all of that. It felt it, it's not something that's like completely super innovative in terms of stealth gameplay overall, no. but it works. You know, it's effective. It's fun. Um, it's good to see it in Metroid. Exactly it's like these these staples that work, but like in Metroid, I, I really liked it. Yeah. Simple, but simple is is good. Actually, I want to add something too. Another reason that I think the um, like escaping from the SAX is far more scary is because I, I think in general, and I actually just started playing Fusion again like two nights ago, I think in general uh, the BSL is just like a much more confined space, mm-hmm. whereas like Chozodia is like very open in a lot of rooms. There's like yeah. room to jump, room to move around. So that, that would be my one uh, observation for that. But um, yeah, I mean, you're definitely right. There are, there are some times where I'm just like, oh my God, like I... 
you know what? I'm going to I'm going to go through and if I don't make it then oh well, I'll deal with it and I can probably escape. And uh, that actually happened to me uh, almost right away. There's a room with like all these different lasers on the floor and on the walls. It's it's pretty early on when you sneak in. Um, I tried to do it stealthily mm-hmm. and I just kept on setting off the alarm and it, like eventually I was just like screw this. I'll just I'll just take my chances and and run with all these space pirates chasing me, right. which is to to be fair which is a lot easier to do because whenever you get to a save room, it completely fills your health, which actually I don't know if I like because it's like, I kind of like, I like the challenge and I like, I like upping the ante and, and whatever. And like, um, I feel like when you like on the one hand, when you get to a save room, it's nice because it's a respite and you can heal up and you're refreshed. But like, on the other hand, like I kind of, I kind of wish that it was just a little bit more hostile. It seems weird that this is the only area in the game where you save and, like, all your health is refilled. Did you notice that? Yeah, but I guess that makes sense, though. It has to kind of balance things out a little bit. You know, you don't have your whole power suit. I guess that's why they also, you know, give you access to the the full map data pretty early because they want to kind of balance things out a little bit. You are at your full power. So, all right, they give you access to a little more knowledge uh, in terms of the map earlier and let you heal because, you know, you might not be able to heal up real quick um, or access yeah. this. So I, I, that always made sense to me. I think that's fine. Like, yeah, sure, it would have been harder to not include that stuff. Uh, yeah, but I don't think, like, they wanted to make it too overwhelming. I think they probably already thought that adding a stealth uh, area as it was might be a little more difficult for cer- certain players as it is. Um Maybe they just didn't want it to be too overwhelming in terms of like upping the difficulty, or maybe they were just interested in really more just having the players be able to get through the area and you know play around with that kind of gameplay and eventually get to the lore and, and all that without having to wade through a, a more difficult area to do so. So I that that was fine for me. I think that's okay. Um, sure, it would have been cooler if it was a little more difficult. Fine, but I, you know I don't think it was. It's not something that stuck out to me. I was like, wow, this made it so much easier. Or I wish it had been done dif- differently. Uh, something I just accepted and I always thought was fine. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm a freak, but I was like, when I was playing Zero Mission, I uh, I was just like blitzing through everything, and uh, and I think I was only about two hours in when I got to uh, Chozodia, and I was like, okay, like you know this this section is pretty tough because you know, you got the space pirates shooting at you, and they take out a full tank whenever they hit you. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I could have done with a little bit more challenge, but I'm it's not a big gripe by any means. Um, but, yeah, so, like, that was... Uh, there's definitely some times where I was just like, okay, whatever, I'll, I'll just set off the alarm and, and take my chances. Um, I feel like you could never do that with the SAX. Like, you want to be in and out as quick as you can in any of the scenes where uh, it's chasing you. Um, I did want to um, talk about a few specific rooms, though, in the uh, in the stealth part of Chozodia here. And uh, one that uh, that stuck out to me um, in particular is like there's a portion where you were crawling, and first of all, it's it's weird that you're crawling instead of like in morphal form, which it always stuck out to me. But, like, so you're crawling, and um, you're on some blocks, and they're the slowly dissolving blocks. So like they don't dissolve as soon as you hit them, but you can see them start to break. So like you got to crawl, and there's um underneath this this row of blocks there's a bunch of space pirates there's probably about like four of them and there's uh, other blocks that you have to shoot in front of you blocking your path so like you've got to crawl and crawl and crawl and like you're trying to go like super yeah. fast because the floor is giving out under you but like you also got this these blocks in front of you uh, i i loved this room it was just like it was like oh my god like guy like go 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 and that one that one stuck out to me is just like a really again simple but great room where i was just like i was just kind of like Ugh! trying to make <laughs> it across no, oh, yeah, I'm right there with you. I remember that the first time I played it, that was one of the more stressful parts. They're just like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <sighs> almost there, you know. Like those, that's a clencher right there. Um, yeah, I like that stuff where it it forces you to really kind of really forces you to be uh be on top of your game, uh, especially when a lot of the time you're kind of just like maybe going going at it a little slowly, and it, you know right. it ramps things up for you. And uh, yeah, I like that. I love the again, like I said earlier, the moments where you you know the pirates are right on you, and and you really got to make a you know, split the deci- split de- split second decision, or just be really quick. Uh, yeah, I love that stuff, and it really kept the the whole area feeling a little, you know, not not one note. You know. You know what's kind of a cool thing about this section too is that when you do get caught and you have space pirates chasing you, um, like typically in a lot of other games, like when you make it into a new room, it's like okay, I'm safe. When you make it into a new room in Chozodia and the space pirate uh, ship. 
pretty much immediately after like another pirate will come in and like follow you so like you got to keep going so you don't get that that kind of cool down time when you enter into a new room that always stuck out to me as well and there are multiple instances in here where like you like you break the floor and then you fall down and like you're right in front of a pirate and like you have no choice but to go 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 so it doesn't really give you a lot of time to like plan out and map your route like mm -hmm. when you're playing metal gear solid you can kind of like you can kind of for the most part hide and survey the area and plan out how you're going to do things where like in zero mission there's a lot of times where like you you shoot the floor you don't know what's going to happen and all of a sudden you're running and like you don't have that time to really plan out or stop or hide and check out and uh and explore like you're you know like you're conditioned to do in metroid so it's very very it's very different from everything that we've seen in Metroid up until this point. Oh, for sure. So this is really a tale of two areas as well, because, you know, like we, like we've been talking about, um, the first portion of Chozodia is the stealth area and you're sneaking around, you're trying not to get caught, you're avoiding space pirates when you get your power suit back, this this is the tale of the second area because now you are basically in full god mode where like everything is absolutely pretty much like to, mud to be crushed under your foot. Um, the space pirates are, are nothing. You have your full weaponry and you can blitz through pretty much anything. There's hardly any other enemies in Chozodia. Um, I felt like once I got the... Once I got the power suit back, I was just like, like I felt just like a, like I was obliterating everybody in my sight. Uh, a few enemies here and there, notwithstanding, but like, it it truly is like a tale of like, okay, like I'm completely helpless, and then you you hit the switch and you're like, okay, well now I'm completely overpowered. It's funny how that works. No, it's great because it's like you know you're gonna get your suit back, so like when you're you're fighting them off and just your zero suit, like oh. When I when I'm back in full power, you're gonna get it, you know. And it feels good to then run and like crush through everything and and absolutely obliterate anything in your path. So I like that they there there's a nice like solid juxtaposition there, that contrast of all right, you're super weak and you, know, you already knew you were super weak because you played the game, but now we're like really showing you how weak you were because now we're putting you at a full OP mode, um, and you finally get to just crush through everything that's been slowing you up for the past 45 minutes. Which is nice. It's nice. It's satis You know, it's it's very satisfactory, and um, I don't know. It's it's it feels great when you finally, especially after completing the trial too. It it does. Yeah. It feels great to be like, ah, oh, finally, you know, finally, you just destroy all of you, um, and do so. So yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love it too, and it's like, it it's so satisfying, like just annihilating the space pirates in like one or two like bursts from your beam after you've been struggling to to stun them at best for this entire time. So um, I, I love that a lot. So let's move on. Let's talk about some of the power-ups and expansions that we can, uh, that we can acquire in Chozodia. And you know what? This is, this is one of the first times where I can think of where it really struck me how like how the power bombs have like kind of replaced the screw attack as the ultimate weapon in Metroid. Like that used to be your, your ultimate tool right like in super metroid that's the last power up that you get it's the screw attack and like once you have that you are you are like more powerful than anything and in this game you get the screw attack not not super early but like early enough and really they make a big deal out of presenting the power bombs as the as the ultimate weapon here and i feel like a lot of metroid games have kind of continued with this trend where like the power bomb is now the last weapon that you get versus the screw attack. Have you noticed this in other, uh, particularly 2D Metroid games? Well, I mean, we haven't really had too many since Zero Mission, right? You know, we've had, like, Samus Returns. And, you know, so it's hard to say, like, has it been replaced? Because like, Zero Mission, it was, I mean, there hasn't really been many 2D Metroids since then. And all the other Metroid games are 3D games, which, like, the screw attack doesn't really translate as well to. So, so far, um, you know, so I don't know. I never really got that feel. I think in this game, I did like, and I did, I did stick out to me that the power bomb is, you know, uh, it seems to be more of like a, 
more importance, I guess. But maybe they were. I don't think I didn't, I didn't never put too much thought to it. I thought maybe it was just like okay, that's just a little difference. Like they're just you know trying to make it so it's not the screw attack every time is the last power up, which I thought was fine. Um, I think in the context of the game it works, but. Yeah, I never really got the feel like, okay, like, now the screw attack's being replaced by the power bomb. I think that was more just a side effect of the more recent Metro games being Prime games or, you know, whatever. Um, so the screw attack doesn't really fit into those. If we had gotten a lot more 2D Metroids in the past two decades, we probably, I think we'd still see the screw attack as being, you know, that kind of end-all, be-all item. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's just, I think it was just kind of a coincidence and maybe them trying to make it a little fresh. Um, and I liked how they, you know, the this the power bomb was like this thing the space pirates are walking around with, and you kind of had to like hunt it down. Um, so yeah, I I think it's kind of just uh, maybe just the decision they wanted to make design wise. I don't really think it points to a larger trend. I also think you know the well, like even even I guess like dare I say, and I don't want to get us on a, a you know a different can of worms here, but like even in other M, like the power bomb is the last ultimate power up, and that's before like you get. I think you get a couple power ups after you get the screw attack in that game, and I know that you've kind of blocked that from your memory, but um, it, yeah, it just—I don't, I don't know—it kind of struck out to me. Hmm, yeah, well, I will—I will admit that yes, I did not—I can't recall that immediately, but um, I mean, maybe they just see it as like okay, the power bomb and the the screw attack kind of like fill the same role in a lot of ways. Um, so maybe that's just like over time they just felt like eh, maybe it's easier to design the game, uh, the end game around the power bomb than the screw attack. Maybe they felt like the power yeah, bomb was more effective, true. or maybe just easier to design around, you know, instead of dealing with like, oh, this is a lot harder to to actually have this screw attack that interacts with everything and the movement of the character and all that, and how it translates to three D movement and all that. Um, maybe it, it could be. A, I think it's a combination of like maybe easier to design around, um, and maybe trying to change things up. Maybe they think the power bomb's cooler. Uh, maybe they just want to go with an item that is, you know, going to be effective in terms of how it's, you know, used and displayed in both 2D and 3D Metroids going forward, whereas a screw attack isn't. I think it's a combination of things, but it is interesting you pointed that out because I never really thought about that, um, like what the last power up you get is. Um, yeah, but I, I guess the screw attack usually was that item, but yeah, maybe the power bomb. They're they're, they're pretty similar items, and I think that as long as they're both like towards the end of the game, it's probably fine. You're probably right. It's just something that yeah. I noticed. I never Especially noticed Especially because they make yeah. kind of a... They make a cool deal out of it in this game because, like, you see the space pirate kind of steal it and walk away with it, and it almost looks ceremonial or whatever. I, I thought that it looked really cool. Yeah, I agree. But at um, the same time, they could have done with the screw attack, you know, and I'm sure the effect would have been yeah. the same. So maybe it was just what they decided was better at the time. Yeah, and, and that's fair. Just, uh, just something that stuck out to me. Um, Dak, I want to talk about a couple of the particular pickups that uh, that i got in this game and you can chime in if you had any that stuck out to you as well but there is there's a room and and this is harder because the 2d metroids don't have individual name rooms like like the prime games do so we're gonna do our best here but there's a room right before you fight robot ridley and um you need to Basically, you need to clear the room, and you need to start uh, speed boosting and jump and kind of break the bricks at the beginning of the room and then fall down. And apparently, apparently, you can then shine spark in midair and, like, zoom to the other part of the room, which I did not know until after I got this tank yesterday. But what I did is I, like, I was speed boosting, jumped down, and then I jumped. And in this room in the lower half... There is lasers at the top, lasers at the bottom, and lasers kind of in the middle. And you have to, like, jump under that. And if you set off the laser and set off the alarm, a gate closes and blocks off this energy tank. Dude, I tried to do this probably, like, ten times before I finally got it. And I did not know that you could just shine spark right across. So I'm, like, I'm space jumping across, and I'm, like, barely barely sneaking under the lasers and like i finally did it and i was so so happy and then i found out that you can just shine spark so this one really stuck out to me it was really creative and really like really challenging i thought uh you know it's funny you bring this up because i always remember playing this as a kid at this area and like not picking up many pickups at all i was just kind of like once i got my suit i just just was like ah, i'm just holding forward i'm just gonna get to the end of the game I know an idea about some of these energy tanks, actually. I remember the... 
you know, the, the pipe that you have to break to get the power bomb or with the power bomb. And there's a bunch of stuff you can pick up there. A couple missile tanks. I think maybe I'd grab one. Um, I don't, I never did any of this crazy shine spark stuff as a kid. Um, and I, I should go back and really give it a try. Cause yeah, I never, I never went for the full completion at that point. I already felt so strong. I was like, Oh, whatever I can do it with whatever I've got. Um, and I was ready to just, you know, kick some ass. So, um, I gotta go back and look at that. Cause yeah, the, the, I didn't realize how much the area kind of tests your shine spark capabilities here. I kind of just was, you know, took it at face value and whatever was kind of easy or in my path I would grab. But, um, that was me. You know, I originally played the game as a kid. Um, later on, I should definitely give that a try though. But yeah, I like that there are these, these cool shine spark areas that again, test you a little more while you still have some other pickups as well. There's actually like an insane amount of, uh, of, of pickups in Chozodia. I'm, I'm looking at a list here. So in addition to, you know, getting your suit back, there are three extra energy tanks that you can grab six power bombs and a whopping eight super missile expansions and one missile expansion. But like there is a plethora of items that you can grab. And yeah, you mentioned something that I actually think that I think that zero mission as a whole actually really does a really great job of just implementing really creative ways to um to use shine sparking to get power ups and like ways that like ways that are just like really innovative you know the next the the next pickup that i was going to talk about is um there's one particular energy tank and you need to start shine sparking in the room over and you need to start shine sparking underwater and um eventually you have to you have to just jump up not shine spark but just jump up activate your your shine spark and then like as soon as you go up a slant, uh, you, you hold down and you jump up and to like another little slanty set of stairs. And dude, you got to do this like, like probably five times and then exit into another room, fall down, jump up and go, get down again. And then like make your way down and then shine spark through a wall. And then you have the energy tank. And it's like such a wicked in-depth sequence. And it's just like, like, man, it, it's so... I just think that Zero Mission did such a great job um, of being creative with Shine Sparking. And it's cool, too, that, like, when you do this, you don't lose health anymore. But, like, it, I, I was just, I was so impressed with, with all the different ways that you use this ability in this game. And, like, it, it made me feel like I was, like, a really good player for, for being able to pull it off, which is kind of a cool feeling. I'm actually not a very good Zero Mission player because it's super easy to do. But, like, it makes you feel like you're, like, you're really good and, like, you're really skilled and powerful. So, like... I love all the different shine sparking techniques that you can do in this game. And I think that they like really do a great job of utilizing that, particularly in Chozodia. Oh yeah. hundred percent agreed. Uh, I, like I said, like, I go back and test myself a little more on those, but um, I think it, it's right up that, the, that part of the game's alley, right? Where you've already done the, the Chozo trials. So now you get to test yourself with what you earned, you know? So yeah, I like it. All right, so let's, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier too, let's let's talk about something else that I love in Chozodia. I love that you have the classic, like, break the tube uh, with the power bomb gimmick in here that we saw in Super Metroid. I love that that's, like, persisted, and now it's kind of a staple of the Metroid series. Man, I hope we see that in Metroid Prime 4 in some form or fashion. But, um, yeah, you mentioned it earlier. There is, um, there is, there's tons of pickups on either side. And I'll I'll bring this one up really quickly because it's another great shine sparking example and uh, another energy tank that I got. This was the last pickup, and I was like I was stuck for forever trying to get this. But basically, when you shine spark the tube or when you power bomb the tube, you can go down to the left, and there's this like really kind of weird slanted room that you can run, and there's tons of enemies, and it looks like it looks like a room that you should speed burst through, but I couldn't figure out why or for what. And eventually I was just like, oh, okay, like you got to speed burst and go up and shine spark through like four different rooms to get to another room where you, there were some, some speed burst blocks earlier. And like, again, so clever, so well done. Uh, I just, I tip my hat at the, uh, all the uses of the shine spark in this game and Chozodia. So yeah, this is, uh, like, I almost forgot that this was full of such wicked puzzles and like wicked uses for this. So you know, like we talked about at the start of the show, Chozodia wouldn't have been like my, it wouldn't have been at the front of my brain thinking of, of places, but I was really glad from a technique standpoint that we actually ended up landing on it. 
Yeah, one hundred percent agreed. Um, all right, let's uh, let's move on and let's talk about some of the lore that you can find in this area. And uh, you were kind of alluding to it earlier, Dak, but I actually want to take it even a step further. I love that you see all, like all the hieroglyphics and stuff in the in the Chozo ruins area of here. I I really really appreciated that, and it adds like such a sense of of like history and and also mystery too, because like you know where are the Chozo? But like one of one of the things that I've noticed about Super Metroid a lot, and I've noticed it because I'm playing through it right now is you know you were you were told that zebus used to be a chozo stronghold or like the chozo used to live here but you don't really ever see it like you don't see evidence of it beyond the occasional chozo statue and i feel like this to me just really kind of got across like okay the chozo used to live here like there was a society here there was a civilization here um there were chozo here at one point and it's not just like you know they're they're showing you and they're not telling you, which which I really appreciated about this. Another thing that you know other Metroid games do well that this uh, section does too is you know even though the Chozo aren't around anymore, it still feels like their presence is somewhat there. You know whether it's like the appearance of like Chozo ghosts or the energy or you know these tests, right? There's always some kind of like latent presence that the Chozo have, and it still makes it feel like alive in some kind of way. But yeah, I love how it really you know gives you a better idea of their actual presence on the planet and seeing like you know in the beginning of the trials that cutscene where you get that you know shot of you know samus holding hands with i believe is old bird um her gray voice but uh you know that the actual connection of seeing the two of them together in game um yeah i mean it's 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 not subtle but it's not a lot but it, it's the right amount of like giving you a little uh, of showing you exactly what it, like you said have been alluded to for so long and not really kind of explicitly shown and, you know, I'm someone who doesn't need everything explained, but this is something that certainly uh, was good to see, you know, in color and black and white and, and in game for sure, because it really strengthens those connections that have been hinted at and established and whatnot throughout the game so far. So to really see that actually, you know, happen in person, I think is really good. And, and again, another you know, real strength of this area that it, you know, really um, expands upon what we've already kind of known, but not really explicitly shown or, you know, outright. So, yeah, and I mean, even the, the overall, like, storytelling of this area, I think, is great. Like, when you're walking through and you have that little shot of, you know, like, uh, Robot Ridley's eye opening as, you know, following you as you're going through the area. Um, and obviously the both cutscenes on, you know, either side of the, the Chozo trial. So, yeah, I like that this, this area was not just, like, an excuse to do some stealth gameplay, which is fine, um, or whatever, just to add a little more content, but actually, you know, substantially, you know, gave us some more information and, and better clarity of things that we've, you know, known for a little bit, but again, not explicitly shown. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah, like, it's it really is, like, a substantial, like, addition to the original Metroid game. But, um, yeah, like... I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm playing Super Metroid right now and I'm just I'm going through and it's it's just like, okay, why would why would anyone ever set up shop here? Like <laughs> want to live here? Like I could totally see why people would want to live on Talon 4, right? Like it's a beautiful place, but like who wants to live on Zevis? It's like this this dark, lonely alien planet. And to see Chozodia and like all of the like it just it felt like kind of a home, which it, it, I thought was important to just establish like, okay, like now I can, now I can kind of get where the Chozo were coming from when they decided to, to like land here and live here. Um, whereas beforehand, it's just kind of like, okay, well there's a Chozo statue in Norfair. Like that doesn't really make sense, but whatever, who cares? Um, so I, I kind of like that. Uh, I also like the cutscenes that you get to with, um, like you said, like little, little Samus holding uh, the Chozo's hand and like it's it's very anime looking but actually I think that that's okay for for this style of uh, of game um, I'm not like a, a huge huge fan of like like overly anime kind of cutscenes or, or aesthetic in general in video games but um, I, I thought that it looked really cool I think like the cutscene where Samus turns from like a kid into like her uh, like just her adult face was was pretty cool. Um, and I loved that, like, the whole thing felt, uh, like, spiritual, almost. Particularly when you get to the final Chozo test. I, I thought that it was, like, it was a very cool vibe. And, uh, again, I, I just, like, I'm a sucker for seeing, like, 
the hieroglyphics and stuff on the wall. I thought that the Chozo, he had like kind of this power suit, but it also looked like a samurai. It looked very, very cool. Uh, I, I was I was a fan of like the small cutscenes in here. And I think that they stood out even more because you don't get them very often. Absolutely. And it again, like really highlights the, the connection to Samus and Chozo. And you get to see like the the Chozo in the back with that armor and then Samus standing like right before it wearing very similar, if not the same armor. Um, yeah, I just, there's a lot of good parallels and a lot of, you know, uh, you know, great side by side images you get and really fills in a lot of like, not what you need, but I don't know. This is information that was good that I think was, was worth explaining and, and showing too. And I, and I, going back to what you said about like calling it a home or showing it a home or, you know, making it seem like this is really somewhere they could actually live. I think that was very important because yeah, like in the previous, in the original game and previous games, it's like, why would they even be here? Like this planet sucks. But now you can see like, okay, like, <laughs> you know, it makes sense. The Chozo, when they land somewhere, they don't like take over the entire planet. They don't, you know, um, completely, you know, drain it of resources and all that. They kind of like make the smallest footprint as they can and have their own area. Right. So that makes sense that they have like their own area of Chozodia, which we didn't see in the original game. And it's so like, different really from the rest of the planet because that's really where the Chozo made their home and the rest of the planet they didn't really want to affect too much leave too much of a footprint uh maybe aside from the you know occasional statue here or there so yeah i like that that they showed us an actual area that would make sense like okay maybe the Chozo would live here maybe they could you know call this place a home and it does make sense because the Chozo are you know like galactic nomads essentially right they you know show up on a planet like all right we could probably survive here for a little bit so they, you know, have this area to themselves and, and that's about it. And then they leave or whatever happens to them. So, yeah, I think it was important to, to give that that depiction of like, this is how the Chozo could live here, even if it's not too crazy, because it's not like we saw too much, but showing that there was an area that was built for them. And, and like you said, the hieroglyphics, it felt lived in, it felt like there were people there at one point, um, which I think was crucial for, you know, the overall experience of the game. Whereas in like Metroid Prime, that's a pretty big part of the game already. Um, but the original Metroid, not so much. So when they did the remake, I think that was definitely uh, an important thing to do. And I like that they did it. And uh, I think it's obviously the importance and the, the legacy of that has continued because so much of what we know about the Chozo and, and Samus's relation to the Chozo um, is informed by this part of, the, of, of Zero Mission. So, yeah. It's really one of the only times that we're ever actually shown rather than told. Um, particularly too. And I'll, but that's like a big thing for me in storytelling is like, show me, don't tell me. And I feel like for the most part, Metroid just tells you that Samus was, you know, had a relationship with the Chozo, was either raised by or maybe even created by the Chozo. Who knows? That's a theory for another day. But uh, I like that they show you in here. You you kind of get that to a very small extent in Prime where you read some of the Chozo lore and they're talking about the Chosen One. But even that's just kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of telling rather than showing again. And especially because you're going out of your way to find it. So, yeah, I really liked it a lot. Um, let's talk about a popular theory. I want your two cents on this deck. So a popular theory is that this ship is actually the wrecked ship from Super Metroid. What uh, what do you think about that? I have a little piece of evidence that I noticed too to back that up because when you're escaping in uh, in the final sequence here, there's that awful, awful R2-D2 looking drone thing in front of you mm -hmm. and you have to keep on shooting it to get it out of the way. And by God, these things are everywhere in the wrecked ship in Super Metroid. So uh, you know, I could I could totally buy this, and that actually that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. I kind of like it, even though they don't look the same. I don't care. <laughs> Just kind of like the idea. I like. I was gonna say, yeah, they don't they don't look too similar, do they? Um, but we know that like in other Metroid games, do like to do the whole oh you were in this ship at one point, and now you get to revisit it again, thing. Uh, yeah, that's that's. Some of the things that you notice, man, it's completely different than what I noticed from Metroid games. Um, no, that's a, that's a good theory. The, the, the little enemy R2-D2, I think, is probably the best evidence you have for it. Um, it could be it. You know, maybe it's one of those things where, oh, it's a different game from different times, so they just look differently. Um, or whatever. Maybe that wasn't their intention. But yeah, that's, I got to start looking for more of those things when I play Metroid games, man. You always got the coolest finds. I just uh, I just noticed it because I remember that thing is always like he's just dawdling right in your ways. Mm -hmm. You're trying to escape. The time is going down. You're like, move, jabroni. <laughs> and like um, I'm playing through Super Metroid again, obviously. And like these these stupid things are everywhere and uh, you're trying to shoot them, push them back as well. So uh, I always enjoyed that theory. I've, I've read the theory that the wrecked ship was a wrecked Chozo ship and that they actually like crash landed on Zebus and that's why they were there. 
but I think that I like this one a little bit more. But you know what? It Both of them are kind of cool to me, and both of them have their merits. Um, let's move on and talk about the music of Chozodia. Now, when we talked about the music of Fendrana Drifts, it's like that has some of the most iconic music in the series, and every track was awesome. I actually don't really feel like the music in Chozodia is all that good. What do you What do you think? I definitely had to go back and listen to a good amount of it uh, because I didn't really remember <laughs> anything from the Chozodia area. So maybe that kind of speaks to my feelings on the on the matter already. Um, one thing that you actually wrote down that I was gonna say was that the Brinstar remix um, was a little bit much <laughs> uh, for for yes. me, especially for that area, <laughs> especially yes. for that area too. Um, yeah, I think mostly it's just it's not very standout, which I guess is makes sense because it's kind of I, I don't know how different the music could really be for that area. It's kind of an extension of another area. I don't know. I'm making excuses for them. I just never I didn't remember any of it. It doesn't really stick with you, and a lot of it's all. It's all remixes, as far as I know, so it doesn't even really have its own kind of uh, identity in terms of sound and music. It's really just kind of takes on things we've heard already, which is fine. I mean, that's a lot of what Metroid music is, but um, at least a lot of the other games have original tracks, too, or the remixes stand out a little more. And I can't really say the same for Chozodia. I'd say it's probably one of the weaker... Maybe not weaker, because it's not like it ever stood out as being bad, but I can't ever, you know, I can't name a single track like, oh, wow, like the Chozodia remix of this is so good. Like, oh, I got to go back yeah. and listen to this. Uh, that's never, ever, ever crossed my, my uh, train of thought. So, yeah, maybe just one of the the weaker departments here for this area just doesn't have to. It's so much. I can understand that so much of the, the area already stands out, I think, from other games. I can give it a pass. But it would have been great to continue to have a little more innovation there in terms of music or, or distinction between other stuff we've heard already. Yeah, I think you nailed it. It's like, this is room temperature water, is how I would describe the music of Chozodia. Or maybe chicken with no salt and no dressing. It's just, it's very plain. It'll fill you it's up, very, you know, but you're not going to be like, ooh. Yeah. Mwah. It's... It's kind of yeah. like, okay, like I don't even want to call it vanilla ice cream because vanilla ice cream can be pretty good and like vanilla pretty cream flavorful. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know. This this is room temperature water. You know, if you're thirsty, it'll get the job done, but it's not going to go down nice and crisp. Um, yeah, it's like I for, for reference, I played through all of Chozodia two days ago from start to finish. I probably spent just two hours schmucking around in Chozodia and I cannot tell you what the stealth section theme sounds like. <laughs> like, I, I forgot. So that probably says a lot right there. Um, I, I will, you know, I'll give it a little bit of props here. Because when you get caught, there's a, there's kind of a cool remake of the Space Pirate theme from Super Metroid. And it's like, it's very urgent. So when you're running away, it gives you some, you know, some tension and um, some, some urgency, I guess. But even that is just kind of like... Okay, and uh, yeah, if you're playing correctly, you're not going to hear that because you're not going to get caught a whole lot. But then, like, when you get the power suit, there is this bombastic remix of the Brinstar theme, and it's just, like, it's a little bit much because it's like, okay, well, I mean, first of all, we've already heard this theme in Brinstar in this game, but, like, it's so, like, it's just so bombastic that it's like, you know, I kind of like the, the ominous, mysterious... Um, spiritual feel of chozodia and like this this giant tune just blaring over me like over and over again is is a little bit uh detracting from that hmm. so it's one of the rare instances where i'm gonna say the music actually doesn't doesn't meet the rest of the the level in terms of uh, a metroid area but you know not that it's bad it's just uh it's okay Room temperature water. Yeah, I guess I guess I get it though, because like I think at that point you might have your suit by then, and like you're really just giving it to the pirates. So I guess the more bombastic theme fits. And again, it's not something ever stuck out to me. I was like, oh wow, this is a bit much. But I guess now I think about it more, maybe it is. Um, it's hard. I'm looking for criticisms of this area. It's a good area. This is probably one of the area parts of that section that you can really be a little more critical. Um, but at least it didn't have any, I, I wouldn't, at least for me, I wouldn't say it detracted. I, I never felt like, oh, this is, doesn't fit or like, I never stopped. I was like, uh, maybe it's a little bit much now in discussion. I kind of can see what you're saying. Um, but it's not something like, oh, this is so bad. This doesn't fit at all. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not something that I was just like, oh, this is awful. But it, it did stick out to me just a little bit. Just because, you know, I, I feel like, for me, Metroid music is at its its most... Um, it's at its best when it's, like, ambient, but also atmospheric. And, like, there, there's nothing atmospheric or ambient about this theme. It's just like, it's like, yeah, we got our suit back, baby. Let's blow some stuff up. And, like, you know, that's okay. Like, um... But it's just like it repeats over and over and over again. It's like, all right, I get when it. I when I see an image or I think of of a an area, right? I should be able to immediately have that music right in my head, you know. Like when we did Fendrana, right. like I could like the the different tracks, like whether it's the main Fendrana theme or the Fendrana like depths area, right? When you're in the caves, it gets a little faster. Like those immediately come to my head. And then, yeah, if I try to think of Trozodia, like I draw a complete blank. Um, and really, you know, you expect from Metroid music to really not only be memorable but really add. And when it doesn't do that, it's, you know, I would consider it to be a bit of a failure. But, again, I think it's just because it was so heavily remix-based, too, especially from other stuff you had just heard, you know, and it's more classic uh, appearance. So, yeah, I think that's just kind of a, a, a too, two-faceted too problem of it being all remixes, maybe not too new, and also being right up against the, the things it's remixing, you know, the original themes. Right, yeah. Uh, very close one next to another, one, af- one after another. So that could probably have something to do with it. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it. Um, let's move on and let's discuss some of the enemies and uh, the bosses from this area as well. And I guess let's start off with the Chozo test. And this this is bonkers to me. I, I actually forgot when I was, uh, what like, what this fight was all about. Um, when I was playing through it uh, and I was in this battle, I was just like, oh my god, like this is, this this battle to me, feels like it would be more at home in like Castlevania area of sorrow than it would Metroid zero mission. You know what I mean? It's like this weird mystical battle where like you, you have to shoot these orbs and like you shoot the four orbs and they fall back into place. And, and when you're done, you get your suit. It, to me, I was just like, this is, this is the Vania part of Metroidvania. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's certainly different than most other Metroid bosses. Like unless like maybe like the stun spore, which is you know a, a, a static kind of thing against the wall. This is it's not a, it's not tied to a particular just unit flying around. You're kind of fighting yourself, and you have to adapt on the fly. I like that it has that that existential dread kind of feeling to it, um, which yeah definitely feels a little more Castlevania-ish because you're fighting yourself. You're, you're shooting an image of yourself. Uh, and you're trying to stay alive against this this thing that's you know testing you, but at the same time could definitely kill you. Um, yeah, it's it is one of the more memorable uh, 2D Metroid bosses of the entire franchise, I think, just because of the importance of the fight, uh, you know, the context surrounding it, and just the actual gameplay. It's it's not something you normally see. It's very you know usual. It's still it's pattern based for sure, but the patterns are different because they're usually based on like an actual specific boss moving around on the area. And this is a little more dynamic than that. Um, takes that whole wall into account, the whole room in a lot of ways too. Um, and I love like the the disjointed like ranged attacks it has, and and you know you gotta also keep aware of where you're standing in the area, which is you know reminiscent of other Metroid fights, so you don't feel too out of place. And I think this is one of the best uh, or more iconic, you know, two D Metroid fights in the entire franchise, and certainly um, is a big part of this area's identity. Yeah, it's just like a crazy fight. It took me forever actually when I was playing the other day, probably like probably like eight hits where I was just like, okay, maybe I shouldn't shoot myself because I'm just damaging myself now. Um, so that took, I, I was stumbling into last place figuring that out, but eventually I got it. I love that. Like it's against this weird, again, like hieroglyphic background where you can see this, this Chozo warrior and like this samurai looking power suit. And like, it's just, it's, it's crazy. And one of the things that like, I really like about it is kind of the way that it presents Samus's power suit again as kind of like a spiritual thing like it's not like a mechanical suit where she has this ability it's like this is a a spiritual act where like Samus has to overcome herself to get her power suit to maybe prove that she's worthy when I was playing it I was just like I was kind of having some thoughts I was like man like like what is her power suit like what like what is it to Samus? Like, is it more than just like, you know, screws and nuts and bolts and stuff like that? Is it like, you know, a part of her being or something like that? I I don't know. I always kind of got like the vibe when I was playing this, that like, like, wow, like Samus's power suit is is just like so much more than like, 
than like any disposable Iron Man suit or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's one thing that Metro has done a really good job of lately, and maybe since then, is making it kind of difficult to understand what exactly the suit is. Um, and But that's, I think, where the, the idea, uh, the beginning of it, that idea of it's not just a regular suit kind of came about. Because I think before that, that were really... It wasn't really ever insinuated, in, and I'm just talking about, like, in terms of their physical releases, right? Like, so Zero Mission was, like, 2004. So, like, before that, like, in Prime and Fusion, like, I mean, Fusion was the first one to really toy with the idea of, like, it being kind of more in a suit, but that was really because of the whole, you know, biological injections and that kind of stuff that, you know, really screwed with it. This was kind of the first time it would they're just straight up like, yeah, it's, like, energy or whatever, <laughs> like, some kind of projection of energy from this wall or something. And, you know, later in, like, other games we see it's, like, more energy than a physical thing. Or maybe it's, like, an organic physical thing. I, I, I Honestly, I could not really tell you what it is. Um, and it seems like Metroid might not even know. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem to... And that's okay. That's, that's fine. It's certainly not prioritizing yep. that. I think that's okay. It doesn't really need to be explained. And I think that's... A, you know, I and, and it also allows you to be a little more flexible, like, in the case of, like, Fusion, for example. Or, you know, in other games that might not be named. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't really, to explain it doesn't really back you into, or, you know, to explain it back you into a corner in some ways, and to not explain it entirely, I think is fine. And, you know, it's a sci-fi game, whatever, it doesn't necessarily need to be, and we, we've also understood because the Chozo made the power suit, that never really was, like, a true, like, nuts and bolts kind of thing. Like, you, can, you can't really accept that when you accept that, like, it, it is somehow able to produce endless power for the charge beam, right? Have no ammo whatsoever. Or any of the other beams, for the most part, um, you know, with some exceptions, you know, for it to be able to hold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of missiles, or somehow be able to, you know, uh, build them at the moment, you know, it, it's needed, or however that's explained, right? If you accept all of that, then you can accept that okay, it's not necessarily a real suit that we would think of like Iron Man having or something like that, or Ant Man or whatever. Um, so I don't know why I went for Ant Man after that, <laughs> um, after Iron Man. But he's got a cool. Song. I like it. I like Ant Man. I'm a big Paul Rudd guy. So um, yeah, maybe that's why. But yeah, so I, I think that was always the assumption, and it really was that. But this kind of game really leads more to the the theory or you know whatever that it is really energy based or spiritual. I think the importance of that is really up to personal preference. Uh, you know, I think it's fine that it's more grounded in reality, and I'm not like the personally the hugest fan of like it just being this like energy thing but i think that's just because of how the uh, that game handled it whereas like with zero mission i think it's kind of fine it has that spiritual and like not religious but that that kind of edge to it right which it makes it feel a little right, a little yeah. less like uh shallow i guess whereas in other games it's just like oh it's made of energy it's probably because of the plot it makes it a lot easier <laughs> for the plot if it's just made of energy and not some physical thing um yeah, I don't know. It's this is the the whether or not this the suit is energy or not, what exactly it is, has always been something that's been a little bit of a point of contention for me. But at the end of the day, never really a deal breaker, and I like how Zero Mission handled it. Yeah, I, and I think that it, it is okay not to know exactly, but I I like that Zero Mission was like the first to kind of present the question or pose the question, because like you you just ask yourself like like what is this like. <laughs> did they give me a new suit or did this thing just like form around my body or like what's going on? So I really liked this whole sequence. Again, this whole thing just felt like it was just like so wacky and just from an, from something else entirely, but it, it works. Um, let's move on. Let's talk about just some of the regular enemies. There's not a whole lot of enemies actually in Chozodia. Um, but I did notice, and again, I'm just playing through super Metroid right now. Um, in Super Metroid, there are those, I don't, even, I don't know what they're called. They're like those little flying nebula things, the balls with the smaller little balls on them. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, I don't know what you call them. <laughs> uh, I mean, it doesn't matter, but they're, we'll call them the, the flying nebulas. Um, these things are also present in the ship and in Chozodia, which, uh, another connect the dots kind of moment for me. But, uh, the, the most dangerous enemy, bar none, in this area are the silver pirates these guys are tanks my god they and you can't you can't shoot them with missiles they just grab a missile and they literally huck it to the side of them i will i will say definitively that the two silver pirates that you fight at the very end after you've beaten robot ridley are like 10 times as challenging as robot ridley himself because like you're these guys can deal some serious damage and they take many beam hits in order to uh, be destroyed 
So it, I actually got to the point where, like, you know, you're in god mode when you're in Chozodia, once you get everything, once you get the power bombs and everything like that. But when I saw these guys, I was just like, nope, running away, not worth it. See ya. Oh, yeah, the silver pirates are probably the strongest enemy in the whole game. And <laughs> those, those guys don't mess around. Um, aren't there also, like, dark black pirates, too, in that area? Maybe I'm just misrem misremembering. I just remember the space pirates towards the end of the game, like, after you've got everything right at the end are some of the strongest. Maybe they're, maybe they're not. They're like silver blacky. Yeah, I thought they were kind of like a chrome, set. monochrome, blackish. But the, oh, yeah, okay. I'm yeah, think, let's, I'm, let's call them chrome. Yeah, maybe. Something chrome. like that. Um, yeah. Th Either way, the pirates at the end are awful. Yeah, yeah. They're they're hard as hell. And they will they don't go down. And you fight them in these and there's in pairs, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, a good amount of the time. So, yeah, those are, those are no joke. And by the way, uh, before... Oh, uh, I forget. Uh, those I remember exactly talking about those like electric things that drop the electric orbs, which are exactly like the ones in Metroid Prime, right? The the bomb, the pulse yes. bomb moves. Um, I don't know what it's called, but yeah, that they're literally right from Metroid Prime, and I always thought that was funny. I was like, oh wow, look at the exact identical enemy here. Um, but yeah, I don't remember what they're called. Anyway, uh, yeah, the space pirates. If you know, let us know. So I'm gonna look it up real quick before the end. But um, the space pirates end certainly they stuck out the most because they're like, oh, these are the the commandos, you know, like those are the ones they gotta bring out to make sure like it's like their last ditch effort to really keep things going. Um, yeah, and I think that's kind of like a trend. You know, you got the you know the later stage space pirates are usually stronger at the end of the game. Right. So yeah, makes sense. And I always I always like them. They're all they those are the enemies I always remember being a threat more than anything else, especially more so than the actual final boss of that area. Yeah, let, let's talk about it. Robot Ridley. Um so when we were ranking Ridley fights way back when, I feel like that was almost ten episodes ago now. We were ranking Ridley fights and I ranked this one middle of the pack. And I think I would still do that just on the basis of like I thought that it was cool and it's different. And I appreciate that, but man, this guy is pathetic. He, like, he is pathetically easy. I, I fought him yesterday, or two days ago. I I did not take one hit. I'm not a very good God player, gamer over okay? here. Oh, I, this I am like an average, I am an average Metroid player. But dude, I did not take one hit. Because all he had, he shoots out some missiles, which you can just blast away. He fires out beams which you can just literally jump over. And, like, at this point, like I said, there's eight super missile uh, tanks in uh, Chozodia alone. So, like, dude, you shoot him once and then twice in the chest with a super missile and his little glass thing is broken. And you pepper him once, twice, three times, four times. He's done. It's like, it's like six or seven super missiles and he is dead. He's done. So, like, before before like he even has a chance to launch basically any attacks he's like destroyed and he doesn't guard himself after you hit him once you can you can hit him again so like dude i was just like i was like come on like get, do something like fight me like come on yeah uh i always liked the concept of this fight i thought it was really cool but it is the easiest i one of the easiest metroid bosses i mean it's like <laughs> laughably easy uh, the fact that you don't really have to move, you just have to jump, so you don't have to worry about your, really your positioning other than, like, you know, vertically, um, which completely takes away a lot of the other fight, you know, what a lot of other fights bring, which forces you to also be aware of where you're standing horizontally. Um, you pretty much just stand there and spam. The attacks you have to avoid aren't even really hard to avoid, and some of them you can just kill for more resources anyway. Uh, yeah, this is, I, again, I love the concept, I think it's really cool. Um, to have, you know, Ridley's working on, you know, a robot looking like himself and it's like unfinished and it's like, you know, lurching at you and, and half complete falling apart, but still like trying to fight you. Um, and it's kind of this like last ditch again, like trying to, uh, do whatever it can to stop Samus or, you know, take it down with him. So conceptually, I always liked it. I always, one of my, one of my more iconic and memorable fights, but certainly not for its difficulty. I think everyone can agree on that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, great concept. I, I still really like the idea, but like, oh my god, man. I was, uh, again, I am not a good Metroid player, and if like if I can beat this without taking a hit, like, I can't imagine what, like, good Metroid players can do. <laughs> like, it's, it's crazy to me. But, um, you know, again, cool concept, and uh, I'm not really complaining because it was an extra boss at the end of the game, 
where we had just assumed that Mother Brain was going to be the final boss. So really, like anything on top of that um, is going to be gravy. Yeah, I agree. And so, I think overall, this whole section is, I think, 100% done... 100% done very well conceptually, and then 85% of the time pretty well execution-wise. Just kind of slips up here and there um, in terms of actually executing it, but I would say those are, you know, speed bumps in the grand uh, scheme of things. Um, right. How they approached it and their intent with this uh, this section I think was flawless, and I think they achieved what they wanted to, and overall, really, I just, I hits, I think, all notes for... Um, looking for something a little different to, from the usual metroid gameplay but still overall kind of being a, a familiar package for metroid fans new and old and i love that they added this to the end of of uh of this original game and i think for the most part you know I and mean, there only been two remakes but i think metroid's been very consistently adding some good end game content as far as i'm concerned for the mm -hmm. remakes so um you know hopefully whenever a metroid fusion remake comes out or maybe a super metroid remake comes out uh, we see some more similar stuff, and I think they'll be uh, confident in doing it. So, uh, you know, especially with how successful it was in Zero Mission and whatnot. So, yeah, I think overall, Trisordia was a pretty overall solid success, at least for me. Yeah, and, um, you know, the the best thing about this is that it really, like, set the expectation that, uh, you know, that we're going to get some, some expanded content if we're going to remake games. Like, uh, you know, I, I love... I love Zelda to death, but like when when we get remakes of games, like there's really not a lot of extra content added in beyond maybe like a shiny new coat of paint on the graphics and whatever. So to me, the 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 additions that Metroid Zero Mission made were like completely substantial. Like I said, I got to Chozodia in about two hours, and I spent about two hours in Chozodia. So it's it was almost like really um, a new lease on life for this game. So um, I really think that it did a good job there. And, um, you know, again, going all the way back, uh, this was suggested to us by uh, by one of our listeners as a, as a next segment for Mapping Metroid. And it wouldn't have been one that I would have probably ever thought of, but I'm glad that we ended up landing here because it was just something so completely different from, you know, anything that we had covered basically before and it's different from from a lot of the areas in metroid so i'm i am glad that we that we ended up here there's a lot of of meat on this bone um and we want you guys to to weigh in let us know where you want us to go next time on mapping metroid we have a few suggestions that uh, that i can think of but of course if there is a big demand for another area uh, we're definitely going to consider it so let us know over on twitter at omega metroid pod um, Dak, any final thoughts on uh, Chozodia before we get out of here? Um, I guess my only few things would be I gotta go back and listen to that music and see if I can think of anything more that stands out to me. Um, I really like this area. I would be down for another stealth section, maybe a full stealth game of Metroid, but I like that it was a section part of the game and not the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, never, you don't want to get too much of a good thing, still too much of it. But uh, I like that it was well done, and this is, I mean, Zero Mission is one of my favorite Game Boy Advance games, one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, a lot of happy memories and positive thoughts, you know, looking back on this game, and I'm glad that, and this is one of my favorite things about doing the Mapping Metroid, you know, sub-series here, is we get to reminisce and go back and dive deep into these areas that, you know, we all uh, enjoyed playing for the first time way back when. So, yeah, this was great. I thought this was a really good pick. It wasn't the, the obvious choice, but I think it was a, a really solid one, and uh, I can't wait for the next episode. Well, we hope that you guys thought that this was a really solid episode of the podcast. Of course, we want you to check us out over on Spotify and iTunes and Podbean, wherever you get your podcasts, uh, like and subscribe. And most importantly, tell a Metroid fan in your life where they can get their fix. Uh, you know, share and retweet. That's the best thing that you can do for the show. We really appreciate hitting 200 followers. We're going to do something, but we haven't figured it out yet. But we'll let you guys know when we do. Uh, we want you to check us out over on Twitter at Omega Metroid Pod. You can find me over on Twitter. I am at Spateri316. And Dak is over on Twitter at the Rapture underscore and also on Twitch. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Until next week, guys, we will see you then.